Okay, great. Everything looks good. You can see your cursor. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're very happy to have Yang Zhao uh, here to tell us about Lattice QCD and PDFs. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and start. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. And uh, I'm very happy to see the old friends and uh, especially those at the uh, LBL uh, where I have stayed a few years ago. So today I'm going to bring back a topic that you might have heard from me before, that is the lattice calculation of PDFs. And it, uh, what's new is that I'm going to show you a currently state-of-the-art uh, calculation of the, at least for the Pyong valence graph PDF, with the mostly recently de derived next, next leading order uh, matching coefficient. So in this talk, I hope to convince you that uh, with all the careful analysis, including the renormalization on lattice, and also this perturbative matching at the two uh, NNLO, we are able to uh, do a uh, reliable calculation of the X dependence of the PDFs uh, within the range of X. Um, so just to give an overview of the background, so uh, in the next uh, decade or, or, uh, or even longer, uh, we expect that there are two strong efforts to study the 3D structure of the, of the proton. One is through the experiments, such as uh, the JLab 12 GV upgrade and the, the electron ion collider uh, in the, at Brookhaven. And the other is through uh, first, principle uh, per, first principles calculations, mainly lattice QCD. So for lattice QCD to have a real impact on these uh, expensive experiments, uh, controlling the precision is the key, and that is the main motivation of uh, this, uh, this talk. Um, so just to have a brief overview, um, the proton can be described by Feynman's simple proton model uh, in the infinite moment frame, which is relevant for high energy scattering. So in this simple model, uh, we can approximate the proton as a beam of almost three quarks and gluons, and, uh, which are called partons each carrying a certain momentum fraction of the proton. And there is a probability density function that describes the distributions of these partons. And uh, they are the PDFs. Uh, they each, there is a particular PDF for each flavor of the partons as well as for the gluons. And uh, there can also be spin dependent PDFs that counts the number of differences of partons carrying the spin parallel uh, and parallel to proton and also spin transverse to the proton, which I didn't show here. So this plethora or this class of pattern distributions give us a uh, full picture of the proton uh, in this one dimensional momentum space. Uh, they are uh, the basic inputs for standard model predictions in high energy scattering experiments. For example, at the LHC, uh, the, the Higgs production cross section from the main gluon gluon fusion channel can be uh, factorized into the, the part on distribution of the gluons uh, uh, times a hard cross section for these two uh, energetic gluons to produce a Higgs boson. So schematically, the cross section formula just need the input from the PDFs and from the perturbative calculation of these hard uh, partonic uh, cross sections. Uh, so the precision of the gluon PDF will decide the precision of the standard model predictions. If you want to find any new physics within 1% uh, access, then it has high demand for, for these PDF inputs. And uh, since they are non-perturbative, they have to be determined from either global analysis by using the data that we have already measured precisely uh, uh, or from first principles calculations. Uh, so, so the PDFs have been measured extensively from this global uh, weather deep in elastic scattering or proton-proton collision experiments since the late 1960s at SLAC. So now we have, uh, so now we are building a next generation machine for QCD, that is the electron ion collider, and uh, which will cost about $2 billion and will uh, prov uh, provide a precise uh, mapping of the 3D proton structures, including this one dimensional PDFs. So our knowledge of the PDF so far has accumulated and uh, uh, it's fair to say that we have a very uh, well uh, uh, knowledge of the unpolarized quark PDFs in the proton, especially for the valence 
U and D crux, as you can see in this figure. Um, so, uh, um, uh, but for the gluons, uh, the uncertainty is fairly larger because uh, uh, it's uh, uh, it, uh, because at a small x there's larger uncertainties, and also for the C quarks, including the strange uh, D bar U bar and also charm quarks, the uncertainty they, they are more they reside more in the small x region, and the uncertainty is larger. And when it comes to spin dependent PDFs such as the helicity PDF, because of the uh, there's less statistics compared to the unpolarized uh, PDF uh, measurements, uh, the uncertainty is also larger. And when it comes to the transversity PDF, which measures the transverse spin dependent structures, the error bars are even larger. And uh, and for the strange quark, uh, these are for the uh, PDFs in the quark region. And for uh, for the C quarks, uh, which are, uh, is a very important focus of the Sequest experiments at the Fermilab. Uh, uh, there's the uncertainties is even larger. So here is a plot of the ratio of the D bar over U bar distribution inside a proton, and uh, uh, the the, error, the the data points are from a, a most recent uh, fit by the Sequest collaboration. As you can see, uh, in the X from point one to point four. Uh, there is still fairly large uncertainties uh, uh, in the uh, experimental results. So if lattice QCD can provide a, a precise uh, a, a calculation of the same or even better precision, that would great uh, benefit uh, the experiments. And when it, when it comes to the transverse structures such as GPDs and TMDs, uh, there's, uh, there's much less uh, knowledge about them from the global fees. So that so if lattice QCD can provide those information, uh, that would be a great benefit for for the experimental programs in the next decade. So 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 that would motivate us to seek for calculations of these quantities from lattice gauge theory, which is the only known systematically improvable approach to solve non-perturbative QCD so far. Um, however. The PDFs, they are since uh, they are the say, since they are defined in an infinite momentum frame uh, where the part-time picture emerges uh, when expressed in formal uh, uh, in uh, when expressed formally in field theory, we can equivalently formulate them on the light front or light cone, and the PDFs are defined from um, the light cone correlation functions separated from a. Uh, uh, a time uh, a light like direction, and on the, however, on the lattice, uh, all the simulations are done uh, with Euclidean time or imaginary time that is analytically continued from the Minkowski real time. So, if we want to simulate all these real time dynamics, we have to deal with a notoriously uh, difficult analytical continuation time, which has been a very difficult uh, problem to solve uh, so far. So to overcome this uh, difficulty, uh, the large momentum effective theory of, was proposed. Uh, so the idea of Sulamed is that instead of trying to simulate a light front correlation, which has explicit time dependence, one can start from uh, the quasi PDF that is defined from an equal time correlation, which is fixed in a single time slice, slice and can be directly computed on the lattice. The relationship between this light front and equal time correlators is through Lorentz boost. So imagine if you have a large enough Lorentz boost along the Z direction, then uh, uh, the equal time correlation will gradually approach the light cone. So to realize this boost, uh, we can calculate the matrix element of this correlator in a boosted hadron state. Uh, and uh, by making the hadron uh, moving very fast, we can uh, do an approximation of the light cone PDF. So the natural question is, uh, if we keep increasing the boost momentum of the PDF, quasi PDF, can we get the, the light from PDF? Uh, the answer is no, because of the divergences in uh, QCD. So this is there's a deeper uh, 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 reason behind that. So in any field theory, uh, they have to be defined with a, a UV cutoff. So on the lattice, the UV cutoff is one over A. So if we want to compute quasi PDF on a light on a lattice, at a, uh, we ha we have to work at finite momentum, which is much smaller than the UV cutoff. Uh, however, 
the parton picture emerges in the infinite momentum frame. And to get the right PDF, uh, we have to take the infinite momentum limit or the light cone limit first before doing any UV regularization. That would imply that the PZ have to be much larger to be the uh, lambda. And in field theories, due to the UV divergences, these two limits are usually not exchangeable. Uh, but the good news is that QCD is asymptotically free. So when the, when the energy scales is much larger than lambda QCD, uh, the contribution will be mainly in the perturbative region. So by exchanging these two orders of limits, we will not affect the physics at low energy or infrared scales. Uh, and the difference between the two orders of limits can be um, given by a perturbative matching condition. So in a general, in a schematic way, we can write this quasi PDF, which is corresponds to the PZ much smaller than the UV cutoff limit uh, to a, convolute, a convolution of a perturbative matching of the light cone PDF plus power corrections that are suppressed by the finite momentum. So um, uh, it is actually quite involved to have a rigorous uh, perturbation theory proof of this factorization formula. But just to give you some uh, very basic arguments, that is, uh, in the in the PDF matrix elements, it is the collinear modes of the partons that contribute uh, to to these matrix elements. So in light cone case, we define the PDF from light cone correlation operators. So the light cone uh, uh, the, the operators would automatically filter out these collinear modes. But for the quasi PDFs we define it with equal time operators. So the fields, uh, uh, quantum fields in those equal time operators will involve all kinds of pattern modes, including collinear modes and uh, uh, all the other maybe hard modes, uh, et cetera. However, when we put this equal time correlator in a large momentum proton state, it is the external state that would filter out the contributions from the collinear modes. So you can show that uh, these collinear modes are identical whether you use a, a large momentum state or use a light cone correlator. Uh, and these identical uh, collinear mode contributions is the basis for this factorization uh, to work. Okay, so for the, to be more explicit, the quasi PDF satisfies this factorization formula at uh, a large but finite momentum PZ. So there is a, uh, uh, there is a, in the leading power, the contribution is a convolution of this perturbative matching kernel. And the uh, clear mu tilde is a renormalization scale in the quasi PDF. And the power corrections uh, through dimensional analysis, we can argue that it should be suppressed by the momentum of the parton, active parton, and also the spectator partons, which carries uh, the, uh, the rest of the momentum. And because we work, if we work in the MS bar scheme, all the power corrections should come uh, in quadratic powers. And to make this formula useful, we can show that we can invert this perturbative matching kernel, which is a series in alpha S uh, by doing an inversion of this perturbative kernel order by order in alpha S. So eventually we can express uh, this PDF in terms of this inverse matching of the quasi PDF. Uh, plus uh, power suppressed uh, corrections. So based on this uh, formula, uh, uh, we can perform precision controlled calculation of the PDF. So apart from the lattice systematics, which include the excited state contamination to the, to the ground state hydro matrix elements, and also uh, continue and the physical power mass and the infinite lattice volume limits, there's also systematics from the theory side that will come into play during the data analysis. Uh, one major uh, 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 systematics is the perturbative matching. Uh, so far, uh, the best, uh, the state of the art matching is calculated at the NNLO for the non singlet quark case. Uh, and there could also be resummations in the endpoint regions when the momentum fraction X goes to zero or goes to one. Uh, so this has been studied in these uh, references. But in lattice calculations so far, only the next leading order matching has been implemented. So this work will demonstrate for the first time 
how the NNLO matching will change the result. And apart from the perturbative matching, there's also power corrections. Um, uh, so we can only calculate the finite momentum. And by this naive power counting, these power corrections are only under control for a region of X. Uh, so in practice, uh, lattice QCD can help us to have a controlled calculation just for a region of X with a target precision. But this can be systematically improved if we can go to larger and larger momentum PZ. So before I move on to the next slide, I want to emphasize that in order to have a, a continuum limit, we have to be able to renormalize these quasi PDFs on the lattice. And that actually is an important source of systematic errors. That is also under theory development. Okay. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to also compare this large moment effective theory approach to another popular approach, which is based on the short distance factorization. Uh, so this short distance factorization approach is also starts from the same equal time correlator in the boosted hadron state. So if we if we work at a short distance, we can show that it has a this matrix element would have a OPE uh, expanded in terms of the many moments of the PDFs uh, times uh, Wilson coefficients that are perturbatively calculable, plus uh, power corrections if the distance uh, plus power corrections. So in in order for this formula to be accurate, we have to work at a very, at a very short distances. And also uh, to make sure that the Wilson coefficients are in the perturbative region. So as I will show you later, uh, we probably can't go beyond 0.3 Fermi because once the distance becomes too large, uh, the strong coupling, the corresponding strong coupling would, would also become large, making this uh, uh, CN not reliable and also the power corrections can be important. Uh, so then this would limit the largest range of lambda, which is Z times PZ that we can have on the lattice. So with the current lattice setup, the largest momentum is three jet. So that will correspond to a maximum lambda to be around five. Since the lambda here is this expansion parameter, we probably can calculate up to the fourth or fifth moments of the PDF from this OPE reliably, but beyond that, uh, we probably can't distinguish it from the noise noises. So that's uh, that's the OPE approach. Uh, 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 another is the pseudo PDF approach that is actually closely related to the OPE. That is, we can uh, resum or sum over all these many moments, which are defined as integrals of the PDFs. And we can show that uh, this e equal time correlation at a short distance can be perturbatively uh, factorized into the light cone correlation convoluted with a perturbative matching kernel where there are logarithms of z square mu square and plus power corrections. So with this uh, a short distance factorization formula, we can get the light cone correlations from the equal time correlation. Uh, and in order to get the PDF, we need to perform a Fourier transform of the light cone correlation. However, as I stated above, the largest lambda we can get from contemporary lattices is probably just uh, around at the order of five. So if you want to perform a reliable Fourier transform with a truncation at about five, uh, it, it is almost impossible for these light cone correlations. Uh, so in order to make use of this short distance factorization, uh, people usually need to make certain assumptions on the functional form of the PDF say these popular choices in global analysis. And uh, that would introduce uh, model dependence to the fitting of this PDF in the end. So in, in, the, uh, in my talk, I will show you a comparison of the analysis on the same lattice data using the LAMET and the short distance factorization approaches. Okay, so to uh, summarize, the LAMET calculation of the PDF involves simulation on a lattice of this bare hadron matrix element. And we need to work at a large momentum to make this whole formalism to work. And also we need to perform a lattice renormalization of the bare lattice matrix elements in order to have a continuum limit. And then in the continuum, we can perform the perturbative matching and try to suppress the power corrections in order to determine the PDF. So far, there have been quite a few uh, have been a uh, many papers on the lattice calculation PDFs. 
or PDFs using the LAMET approach. And the two, I would say, um, uh, iconic or milestone calculations were done in 2018 of this proton isovector PDF, which was uh, done using the uh, regularization independent momentum subtraction uh, renormalization scheme on the lattice and using a next leading order perturbative matching. So the left panel is a calculation by me and my collaborators in uh, uh, on the helicity PDF, which showed uh, agreement with global analysis within one or two sigma, within two sigma uh, uh, with, uh, in the moderate X region. And the other is the transversely PDF, where the a lattice calculation done by the ETM collaboration shows greatly improved uh, systematic uncertainties compared to the global fit. Uh, so in both approaches, the renormalization was done using the RMOM scheme. But as I will uh, argue later, this renormalization scheme is problematic when the correlation is at a long distance because it will introduce non perturbative effects. So in this new calculation uh, today, uh, we are using a totally different uh, hybrid scheme to, to overcome this limitation. Uh, so let's get back to lattice renormalization, an important source of systematic uncertainty. The non-local operator we start from is a quark bilinear in the in the space-like direction with a gauge link uh, in uh, in between them to make it a gauge invariant. Uh, it has been proven that this non-local operator can be multiplicatively renormalized in the Z space uh, with a exponential factor uh, where the exponent is a mass correction times the length of the gauge link. And the mass correction includes a linear power divergence that originates from the Wilson line self energy. And apart from this uh, linear divergence, there are also logarithmic divergences that depends on the lattice spacing A. And they actually correspond to the renormalization of a heavy to light current at each of the uh, endpoints. Uh, so based on this relation, we can perform a non perturbative lattice renormalization in a Z space. And that has already been done in the literature. Um, so, so we can schematically write the renormalized quasi PDF as the Fourier transform of the lattice renormalized matrix elements in the particular scheme X, uh, where this renormalization factor would depend on the position Z. So, a perfect renormalization scheme should satisfy these um, conditions. First, when the Z is small, which is of the order of the lattice spacing, we need this renormalization factor to not only cancel the UV divergences, but also the discretization effects in the matrix element. Uh, on the other hand, when the distance is large, say when Z is of the order of one over lambda QCD, this renormalization factor should not introduce additional non perturbative effects other than subtracting the linear divergences uh, in the Wilson line self energy. So currently, uh, uh, in, the lead, in the lattice calculations, no scheme has satisfied these uh, two requirements. For the ratio type schemes, they uh, where they use the matrix element of the same operator in either a quark state, that is the RMOM scheme, and also the ratio schemes where they use hadron matrix element of the same operator, or the vacuum expectation value of this operator to renormalize uh, the bare matrix elements. So in, in all these schemes, these kind of matrix elements are all non perturbative Only at a short distance, they could have an operator product expansion where we have perturbative control. But when Z becomes large, uh, they will involve non perturbative effects that we have no control over. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they are good, uh, these schemes are very ideal choices for short distance renormalization because they can exactly cancel both the UV and the discretization effects. So uh, the hybrid scheme that we are using is motivated by, yes? Young. Hey, sorry, mm -hmm. I joined a little late. Uh, I had a, I was a little, I have a question about this statement that you need to cancel discretization effects. I was wondering, I don't know if you mentioned this earlier, but mm -hmm. I, I guess I don't know exactly what you mean there. Cause you know, oftentimes we renormalize quantities and we still, we'll see some small discretization effects. I assume that's not what you mean, but there's some yeah. other sort of. Yes. So we can cancel all the discretization effects. You're right. <laughs> Here we want so, to cancel, yes. 
we want to specifically cancel the effects that's caused when a physical scale Z is of the same order of A, right? So that's, uh, that turns out to be quite important. Uh, so, and the, this effect is a short distance uh, effect in the operator. So if we use the matrix element of this operator in a different state, we should expect a, a cancellation of that uh, A dependence to a good extent. Can I think of the, is a, an example of this would be like when you have a matrix of operators that makes them one of them's power divergent, you're canceling like the power divergent operator. Like if you do the old style calculation with the higher twist, mm -hmm. is that an example of what you mean by a discretization effect you cancel? I, I mean, say like A over Z. Yeah. They are not power divergent, right? If you work at an infinite, uh, in, with, at an A goes to zero limit, they would just go away. But when you have a finite lattice spacing, the A over Z still can can be can be significant when Z is small. Mm -hmm. But the power that's saying that's an, that's some unphysical feature of finite lattice spacing. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll, thank you. Yeah, but power divergence uh, goes like Z over A, right? Yeah. The A is in the denominator. We have to subtract them to have a continuum limit. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so so uh, the hybrid scheme is motivated by the inefficiencies of this uh, scheme, uh, the existing scheme at large distance. So the idea is that we, we uh, separate the renormalization into a short distance region and the long distance region. In a short distance region, we can use a ratio scheme. Say, for example, for the boosted matrix element at a, uh, at a finite A, we use the zero momentum matrix element to, re to renormalize all the UV divergences. And uh, uh, the, the finite A dependence that's related to A over Z will also be can canceled to a large extent. This has been demonstrated. Actually, this is the ratio scheme that was originally proposed by uh, Radishkin and uh, Costas Orginus in their, in their first paper on the pseudo PDF approaches. And uh, this would have a well-defined continuum limit because all the UV divergences only depends on uh, Z and A. Uh, what's different is that uh, at a long distance, we don't want to use this uh, non perturbative matrix element anymore. Instead, we want to do a minimal subtraction of this uh, uh, linear divergence. Uh, and then we match the two renormalized matrix elements at uh, this ZS basically by enforcing a continuity, continuity condition. So we can determine that this is the renormalized matrix element at the, uh, when Z is greater than ZS. And by our choice, the ZS must be uh, remain perturbative so that this denominator is still a perturbative factor. Uh, it's still in the perturbative region. Uh, but at the same time, this ZS should stay away from the lattice spacing in order to suppress the discretization effects that goes like powers of A over Z. So, uh, so that's uh, the ZS. And uh, uh, in the long range, in principle, ideally we want to go to uh, use this uh, uh, minimal subtraction to Z equals infinity, but due to the finite volume on the lattice, we have to truncate the matrix element at some ZL that is of the order of one over lambda QCD, perhaps around one for me, between one for me to two for me. And beyond that, we don't have lattice data, uh, but uh, 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 these kind of correlations, because they are space-like, uh, as has been, uh, as has, uh, been done in a, sim a related calculation, the hadronic correlation functions will exhibit an exponential decay at large Euclidean separations. So we can do a uh, uh, exponential extrapolation uh, to the infinity and then do a Fourier transform. Since this ZL is usually very large, around one to two Fermi, this uh, extrapolation will only affect the Fourier transforms in a small X region. Uh, but the LAMET cannot predict the small X region with controlled precision anyway. So this uh, region uh, should, uh, should uh, have a very minimal impact on the moderate X region that we want to make a prediction.
Okay, so here is our lattice ensembles used for the calculation. The calculation was a cal a used data from uh, uh, Wilson flow, uh, uh, Clover valence fermions uh, on two plus one flavor HISC configurations. So we have two fine lattice spacings, one is 0.06 Fermi and the other 0.04 Fermi. And the pion is at a 300 MeV valence mass. Uh, the largest momentum we have on the final lattice is 2.42 Jeff. That would amount to about a factor of eight Lorentz boost factor. The way we determine the Wilson line mass subtraction is from the uh, static quark antiquark potential, VR. This VR is uh, determined from the Polyakov loop, uh, which is the lattice version, we, we lattice of R. And uh, we can impose a, uh, a subtraction condition on this potential at a critical distance R0, which is the Sommer, Sommer scale in two plus one uh, uh, QCD. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a coefficient 0.95 that is actually defines this subtraction scheme. So if you vary this constant number, you, can, you will change this delta MA by a constant factor. So that corresponds to a different scheme choice. So, so this delta MA has actually been studied uh, with very uh, uh, system, uh, uh, extensively by uh, Gunnar Bali et al. and Pineda et al. Uh, since 10 years ago, over 10 years ago. And uh, uh, it is known that this delta MA includes two parts. One part is the linear divergence that we want to subtract. Uh, it is proportional to one over A times a perturbative series in the strong coupling alpha S. Uh, it also includes a finite piece that is of order lambda QCD, which is uh, uncertain. We don't know how to determine it. And it corresponds to the infrared renormalon ambiguity in this perturbative series. So uh, that is the, uh, the delta MA. And uh, following this method, we, have, we are able to determine this delta MA on each of the two lattices with very high precision. W one is around 1% and the other is uh, sub percent. So with this delta MA, we can first check if it does really subtract the linear divergence. So based on this multiplicative renormalization relation, we can form this uh, ratio. So we've we first subtract the delta MA from both the numerator and denominators. And then uh, by forming the ratio of this numerator denominator, this uh, Z independent renormalization factor ZO will cancel out. So this ratio, if, if the, uh, we'll have a well-defined continuum limit, if the delta M does indeed re, uh, subtracts all the linear divergences. So on the left panel is the ratio without these are linear divergence or delta M subtraction. So you can see, we can see clear differences from the two different lattice spacings. But after the mass subtraction, uh, we find that the ratios at the two different lattice, lattice spacings are almost uh, identical to each other. If we, if we zoom in, the difference between them is at a sub percent level. So this uh, shows that this delta MA that we determined does indeed uh, subtract the linear divergences in the bare matrix element. So that's a good start. Okay. So the next step for us is to match this lattice subtraction scheme to the continuum uh, scheme or in the MS bar. So we, we first note that uh, this uh, renormalon ambiguous finite constant delta M0 is not just uh, unique for lattice is also universal in different schemes. For example, the MS bar scheme. If we perform an MS bar operator product expansion of this matrix element at a short distance, we will find out that uh, apart from the operator product expansion, uh, which expands in Z square, there's also a renormalon ambiguity term coming from the self energy of the gauge link or Wilson line. And this renormalon is, has a UV origin and it is similar to the heavy quark renormalons in HQET. Uh, uh, and, uh, and this renormalon contribution actually will, be, will persist for all the distances, which means uh, it, it is, uh, in, in a sense, is non perturbative. Um, uh, uh, so once you determine a short distance, you can use it for the large distance matching. And in the OPE, 
if we calculate in the zero momentum matrix element, then there's only one single Wilson coefficient that contributes at leading power, which has been calculated at NNLO with a with its three loop anomalous dimension unknown. And uh, uh, at subleading power, there will be contributions from that are related to the infrared renormalons. And the, the leading infrared renormalon has a quadratic dependence on Z. So, so by utilizing this short distance uh, expansion of this MS bar matrix element, we can match our lattice ratio to the MS bar OP, uh, OPE ratio with this formula at a short distance. So uh, basically, I just plug in the formulas into one equation. Uh, so the matching will be decided by uh, this uh, exponential factor, e to the minus m bar naught time, times z minus z naught. So this m bar naught is actually the combination of the lattice uh, m naught, uh, delta m naught, uh, forget, uh, forgive my notation here, plus this ms bar ambiguity. So in this way, uh, this matching will cancel the scheme dependence on the lattice, but we will introduce the scheme dependencies in MS bar. So, uh, so that's uh, uh, so that's the uh, the a key to this matching. And uh, if we don't include this matching, we can show that this M bar not term, this exponential term, will induce a linear power correction in the Lamette expansion. Therefore, it will slow down the convergence to the PDF if we do do the matching. So, uh, so for our purpose, we should be able to sub, uh, do this matching to, to make the result converge faster to the PDF. So this is our model used to determine this M bar naught. So we simply consider the, the leading or the first subleading power correction to the OPE with a quadratic term uh, with a coefficient lambda. And we fit these two parameter model to these uh, lattice ratios uh, at the next next leading order. And uh, since we have two lattice spacings, we first compute the lattice ratios and take the continuum limit with an A square dependent uh, continuum extrapolation and then fit these two parameters. Uh, so since here we, we are fitting to a, to a range of Z, uh, ideally we should resum the logarithms in this Wilson coefficient uh, using the renormalization group equation. So this renormalization group equation improved or resumed coefficient can be given by uh, this Wilson uh, coefficients at a scale related to one over Z uh, times this uh, uh, evolution factor. Uh, so a question for us is when we choose to, or when we want to fit the two parameters from a range of Z, how small the Z should be? Because this OPE formula will will not be valid when z becomes large. Uh, we might, have the, the higher order per, uh, power corrections may be important. Uh, and also the perturbation theory may be not under control. So we had a study of the comparison of this fixed order Wilson coefficient and the RG improved Wilson coefficients as a function of z. So here is a comparison of them at up to, from NLO up to N3LO. For N3LO, we, 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 don't, we only know the coefficients of the logarithms. We don't know the finite pieces, but we guess the finite pieces by assuming that it grows geometrically in the order of alpha s. So here is a comparison of them. As you can see, when z is small, say smaller than 0.2 for me, then the resumed Wilson coefficient is uh, uh, almost the same as the fixed order Wilson coefficient. But when z becomes larger than 0.2 for me, the resumed result grows rather rapidly. So there's a huge deviation from the fixed order Wilson coefficients. This indicates that the perturbation theory uncertainty grows significantly when Z becomes greater than 0.2 for me. So ideally we should not use, we probably should not use Z up to 0.2, uh, greater than 0.2 for me. But in our case, our lattice spacing is 0.04 for me. So in order to suppress the finite effects we have to sacrifice uh, the rigorousness. Uh, so we chose the Z naught in the denominator to be 0.24 for me, which is six times the lattice spacing on the final lattice, which should have a good suppression of the discretization effects. And uh, we fit our range of Z in the numerator up to uh, 0.4 for me. Uh, 
so in the future calculations, if, if we have final analysis, we, we can reduce the range to just to make sure that we are working, uh, you know, uh, we are very careful with the validity of this OPE formula. And you know, uh, and, and, and because we chose uh, Z to a quite a, uh, up to 0.4 for me, we might have a large theory uncertainty. So in order to estimate this theory uncertainty, we will vary our uh, MS bar scale mu by a factor of uh, square root of two or one over square root of two and uh, evolve the final results to the same mu to estimate the uncertainty from this uh, uh, feeding procedure. Okay, any question? Sure, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, you mentioned doing a linear and A squared extrapolation. Mm -hmm. Unless you've improved the current, mm -hmm. then you in principle have order A correction, right? So I was wondering mm -hmm. if yeah. you checked if the, the stability doing linear and A instead of A squared. Right. This was checked in a previous paper using the short distance factorization approach to get the moments of the PDFs. And with the, uh, same, with the same action. Yeah, with the same lattice data, actually. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Eventually, we, we, our preferred form is A squared. Uh, okay. Um, so, um, all right, where are we? So, let's move on. So, yeah, here we chose Z naught. Uh, uh, smaller than z up to 0.4 for me, uh, and here is our uh, uh, and here is our fitted result. Actually, we plot the two parameters as a function of the maximal z uh, we choose in the fitting range. So here is the result for m bar not as a function of z max. We let our z max go to up to one for me, uh, and this is the result for lambda. So here are a few takeaways. So if we first look at mu around 2 jeff or 1.8 jeff, the parameters that we fitted are almost constant uh, in the, the maximal z, which shows the st stability of the result. Or at least for a certain region, uh, the, uh, a constant value of m bar naught and lambda can, uh, can uh, well describe the data. But we also notice that the fitted parameters are quite sensitive to the choice of mu here. That is an indication of the, uh, of the theory uncertainty uh, uh, because we, we used fixed order Wilson coefficients and also because we used a range of Z that is actually a little bit larger than where the validity of perturbation theory requires. So, so that's why it's very important for us to check the, the dependence on mu in the final result. Uh, uh, as, as I will uh, come back later. All right. So in our following analysis, our central values are chosen at mu equals 2j, which is a popular choice in, in lattice calculations. And then we vary mu by a factor of square root of 2 and uh, 1 over square root of 2. OK. So after we opt in this uh, uh, mass matching parameter, m bar naught and lambda, we can get uh, we can apply them to the hybrid scheme matrix elements. And this is the matched hybrid scheme matrix elements. So at short distance, we do a ratio scheme renormalization. At large distance, we do a, a Wilson line mass subtraction and also the mass matching. And then you may notice that two factors, one is the normalization factor N. This N was chosen to normalize the matrix elements to exactly one when Z equals zero. And the other factor is the ratio of, of this uh, OPE plus a quadratic power correction divided by just the, uh, the Wilson coefficient. Uh, this is because uh, after we fitted M bar and lambda from our uh, lattice ratios, we find that this uh, quadratic correction is actually not small, even at a 0.24 Fermi. So, so since we know that uh, this two parameter model can describe the matrix element very well, uh, we can actually correct this quadratic power correction in this uh, in the continuum version of this uh, denominator. So eventually, if we work in a continuum limit, the, this matched matrix element will be given by this MS bar matrix element 
with the renormalon ambiguity subtracted divided by the Wilson coefficient only, which is the outcome of this, uh, um, uh, of this factor. And uh, beyond uh, ZS, it is the ratio of this uh, renormalon removed MS bar matrix element divided by the Wilson coefficient at ZS. So as you can see, the difference between this uh, matrix element from this uh, MS bar, not matrix element, is just by this uh, Wilson coefficient with Z up to ZS. So as long as ZS is in the perturbative region, uh, this uh, matched hybrid scheme can always be perturbatively related to the MS bar scheme. Okay. Here is a plot of our renormalized and matched matrix elements at a given light spacing. We uh, at a different at a five uh, pi momenta. So this matrix element is plotted as a function of uh, lambda equals ZPZ, which is a Lorentz uh, invariant product. Um, sorry. So we we can notice that these results they all start with agreement at short lambda, and then they start to deviate. And as PZ increases, the agreement between the different matrix elements will uh, reach larger and larger lambda values. The reason is that when we gradually increase the momentum of the pion, the twist two contributions in the, uh, will start to dominate the matrix elements. And in the twist two part, the difference at a different PZ is just related by a log PZ uh, evolution, which is given by the big lab equation. So that evolution is quite slow. So that's why we see um, more and more agreement at a larger PZ. Uh, but this agreement will eventually break down when lambda becomes too large, because we are still working at a finite PZ. When lambda becomes too large, that means Z becomes very large, maybe beyond one Fermi, and that's where the power corrections or non perturbative effects becomes dominant, and we would see a clear differences at different momentum. Okay, so the next step for us is to perform a Fourier transform. As as I said, we have to deal with the the the, the finite range of lattice data, so an extrapolation is necessary. So so previously in this paper, it was shown that in the zero momentum matrix element the hadronic correlation functions will decay exponentially. But if we uh, work with a non-zero matrix element, uh, we can use Lorentz invariance to argue that it will still feature an exponential decay, but there could be some uh, functional dependence on uh, p dot x, which is, the, which is a lambda in our case. And uh, this dependence can be, can be a should be a regular function uh, in p dot x, but it could involve oscillations like cosine and sine dependencies. So, so our extrapolation uncertainty will be from the functional form of this uh, regular function of p dot z. So in order to uh, estimate the extrapolation uncertainty, we considered a few different models. So the first is a discrete Fourier transform. So this is actually the worst model because it's basically is assuming that the matrix elements goes to zero beyond the truncation point. And we also consider a simple exponential decay model, which in, in, uh, includes an exponential factor and also a power law decay. And in contrast, we compare it to a power law decay model. And we also consider a two parameter models where the two parameters are actually, uh, 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 and this model is motivated from the inverse Fourier transform of a two parameter model for the PDF. So at large lambda, they have this asymptotic behavior in lambda. And again, we would add a exponential decay and or result of exponential decay to see, uh, uh, to, to estimate uh, this uncertainty uh, in it. And in our extrapolation, we truncated at the 0.92 Fermi, which is uh, quite large as the matrix element falls close to zero. And uh, here are the results of the extrapolation and the Fourier transform. So first, uh, looking at the extrapolation, uh, within the arrows, there's not much differences between these different models. Uh, but, the dif but there's still a difference in how quickly the correlations decays to zero with and without this exponential decay. If without the exponential decay, and then the power law decay will, will change very slowly. So the convergence of the Fourier transform is not as good as this exponential decay. 
The lower panel is the Fourier transform of these extrapolated correlation functions. Uh, so here, for this exponential extrapolation, uh, we also varied uh, the lower bound of this effective mass just to see uh, its dependence. So as we can see below, except for the discrete Fourier transform, which has an obvious unphysical oscillation, the other extrapolations are consistent with each other, uh, except for a small X region X, uh, for uh, below 0.05. In the region, in the large X region above 0.05, the different extrapolations yield consistent results. For those models without, without this exponential decay, we can see that their, their error bands, uh, they, they are still some tiny oscillations. That is because of the slow decay in these um, models. It's hard, uh, the, uh, the Fourier transform will induce some tiny oscillations of this slow decay. But if you have this exponential uh, factor in this extrapolation, then the result is smooth and they agree with each other very well. So, uh, so, so that's the Fourier transform error. Okay, the next is to, uh, and we also compared the extrapolation at different ZL. So here is one uh, uh, lattice spacing and momenta at different ZLs. As you can see, there's barely no difference uh, uh, where you truncate the ZL as long as the matrix element is close to zero at that point. The next step is for us to do the perturbative matching. So in the left panel, I compare the, the quasi PDF with next leading order and next next leading order corrections. So as you can see, the, the matching correction is quite tiny uh, compared to the tree level uh, matching and uh, is pushing the PDF to the smaller X region. Uh, I'm sorry. On the right panel, I plotted the ratio of the next leading order correction to the quasi PDF to the ratio of uh, next and next leading order correction to the, to the quasi PDF. And then you can see that First of all, both NLO and NNLO corrections are quite small for a, for, a, uh, for a moderate range of X. And the NNLO correction is generally smaller than the NLO correction. So this shows that our perturbation theory correction is, uh, has good convergence, uh, which without the NNLO correction, we have no way to estimate. So this is a great step to improve the precision from the perturbation theory. Another thing we have checked is that uh, we, we can find is that uh, after matching, the statistical uncertainty band in the quasi PDF is reduced. Uh, this may look a little bit surprising, but um, uh, after uh, consideration, uh, as, uh, the explain we find that explanation, explanation is that the matching will effectively um, uh, push the PDF to smaller and smaller X regions. So, the X at one point in the PDF is actually receives contributions from larger X regions of the quasi PDF, which has smaller uh, statistical errors. So that explains why the error, uh, the statistical error bars in the, in the matched result is reduced. Uh, and the, based on the right panel, we see that the perturbative corrections become out of control in the endpoint regions. So for large X is quite obvious. For X greater than about 0.8 or 0.9, uh, it is becoming greater than 50%. And at a small X, it's surprising that even at the small uh, X as small as 0.05, it seems that the perturbative correction is still small. But of course, at the X close to zero, it blows up. So this might be explained by the lamed expansion that we have, uh, we have logarithms of mu over x pz and also logarithm of mu over x minus one pz. So if we look at the small x region, uh, we find out that the, the one loop matching kernel will have an asymptotic logarithm of mu square over four x pz square. Uh, and uh, the whole thing, the, the whole matching kernel is a plus function. So the singularity near y equals x is taken care of. So this means that when X gets close to uh, zero, there is a logarithm of mu over two times square root of X PZ. So that square root of X probably is the reason why we have a, uh, why this perturbation correction is still under control. 
because that would enhance the value of two uh, times square root of x of pz to make the perturbation, to make the logarithm not too large. Okay, so we have good perturbative convergence. We also tested the, the extrapolation model dependence. As we already show in the quasi PDF, the different models yield consistent distributions uh, for x greater than 0.05. After matching, we find that the agreement turns out to be even better. The reason is that the matching pushes large x in the quasi PDF to the smaller x region. So that would push the agreement in the smaller x region uh, to, to even smaller x. Uh, and uh, in the moderated x region, the, the, the agreement uh, uh, is also improved, except that for the two parameter model, there's still tiny oscillations due to the slow decay of the extrapolated correlation function. We also uh, checked the factorization scale uncertainty. So, the, uh, so just for a simple check, we considered the PDF calculated at uh, two scales. One is 2.0 and one is 1.4. At 1.4, the strong coupling becomes quite large. So this is uh, the main region where uh, that introduces the scale variation uncertainty. So once we get the PDF at these two different mu's, we evolve them to the same two jet. And here is a comparison. So if we do NLO matching, uh, then the, diff the scale uncertainty for the mean values are represented by the red band. And uh, the, N, uh, the blue band represents the scale variation uncertainty at the NNLO. Uh, as you can see, for X smaller than 0.4, there's barely no uh, uh, variation at the NNLO compared to NLO. And while for X greater than 0.4, this scale variation is reduced by a factor of two. So this is a, a, a very nice result as we expect that a higher order perturbative correction will reduce the scale uncertainties. This is also a vindication that the, uh, the, the, the uncertainty in the matching of the Wilson line mass from, uh, from lattice subtraction scheme to MS bar scheme that does not contribute significantly to the final results. So that uncertainty is, is still under control. So, uh, so this is a very uh, important test. And the next, we checked the, the momentum dependence in the final results. So again, we compute the quasi PDFs at uh, one, two, three, four, five units of momentum up to 2.242 Jeff and apply the matching. So as you can see, before the matching, the results are quite different uh, at, uh, uh, at the NZ equals three, right? Uh, uh, but after matching, you, we notice a convergence in the final result for PZ greater than uh, greater than NZ equals three, that's 1.45 J. So originally the, this green band and the, the blue and the red bands are quite different, but after matching the, the green band uh, overlaps quite well with the blue and the red band, which shows that the matching is indeed uh, doing its job to, to correct the PZ dependence and then make the results converge at least in the moderate X region. So, uh, this is a, so we also plot the result at different PZ as a, uh, as a function of X times F of X. So, because we noticed that when X gets close to one, there is a non-vanishing tail in the, in the final result, which is due to the unsubtracted power corrections. So we want to study the effects of these power corrections at x equals one. So you can see that at different momenta, they all have different uh, non-vanishing tail, but uh, this, the size of this tail generally decreases with increasing PZ. So that's a sign that uh, if we gradually increase our PZ, we will improve the power corrections in these endpoint regions. Um, okay, but on the other hand, at the x close to zero, we find that uh, it's not very sensitive to, to PZ, mainly because the, P, the central value of the PDFs also diverges at a small x. So the relative size of this uncertainty is suppressed. So here is a summary of our systematic uncertainties. Our statistical uncertainties is obtained by bootstrap uh, resampling. So, and our scale variation error is obtained by letting the final result covers the result from choosing mu at three different scales. And, and the truncation error is extremely small, so it's negligible. And so is the extrapolation model dependence. And uh, to estimate higher order perturbative matching, 
we assume that it grows geometrically. So if we require the three loop matching to be smaller than 5% effect, that would require the NLO to be smaller than 37% and the NNLO be smaller than 14%. That would re, uh, ex, uh, reduce the reliable region of X to 0.03 to 0.88. And then we also did an estimate of the power corrections. Uh, the, the idea is that we fit uh, the different uh, final results at different PZ with these two parameter function, functional form with a quadratic PZ dependence. And we require that the quadratic dependence uh, the quadratic correction is smaller than 10% of the fitted uh, leading term. And that would restrict the region to, to be 0.01 to 0.8. However, uh, between this fitted FV of X and the largest momentum result, we decided to use the largest momentum result as our final predict prediction. The reason is that when we do this fitting, the different momentum, uh, the, the different the data sets at different momentum have different statistical errors and uh, the statistical error is smaller at a, at a smaller momentum. So this fit is largely determined by the small momentum data sets, which have larger power corrections that might be biased. So, so we decided to use the largest momentum, which has larger statistical uncertainties, but it is it's supposed to have smaller power corrections. So here is our final prediction compared to global fees and a short distance factorization approach of the same lattice data. So we first comment on the global fees. So here we have to exclude the region of 0.03, smaller than 0.03 and greater than 0.8 uh, uh, for our target precision. And uh, we find that within this region, our result agrees with the most recent X feature, which is in 2020 fit. And also the, the recent jam fit uh, with NLO uh, 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 coefficient functions. You can see that in the region of 0.2 and 0 0.6, 2 0.6, our result, uh, the, the jam result is within our uh, uncertainty band. And uh, we also have a good agreement with X feeder. But the, the, dis uh, the disagreement with the, the earlier fits by GRVP1 and the ASV is, is obvious. And here is a table to summarize the uncertainties uh, as a function of X. So, as you can see, the statistical error is the largest source of uncertainty in the calculation. It can amount to 15% at uh, x equals 0.8 uh, because the central value at x equals 0.8 is also large. And the other uncertainty is from the um, uh, important uncertainty is from the scale variation and also power corrections, which becomes more important at a larger x. Um, here is a plot of x times f of x, that it may be easier for you to see the agreements and disagreements. So I want to uh, point out that here, the dark red band is the statistical arrow and the, the purple band is statistical plus scale variation arrow, which is a, li a little enlarged. So finally, I want to use one slide to discuss the comparison between this Lamet uh, result and the a previous short distance factorization approach uh, using the same lattice data. Uh, the previous short distance factorization approach only used next leading order Wilson coefficients. Uh, uh, but since the perturbability, uh, since the NLO correction converges well, so it's not a, a very important source of uncertainty. So we can see that if we compare this work with the, uh, with the BNL20, the previous work, our central values are shifted a, a little, uh, but our new result uh, shows significantly reduced uh, uncertainties. Uh, so that's um, uh, a major difference. And, um, but still we agree with each other within our uncertainty band, mainly because the previous an analysis has a larger uncertainty. So to explain the difference, uh, we think there are, here are a few uh, reasons. So first off, if we work at finite momentum and with finite lattice statistics, then lattice QCD can only predict uh, a region of X with a reliable uh, precision or systematic uncertainty. Um, uh, this is, can be argued from both power counting or from effective theory uh, or from OPE validness. Uh, on the other hand, in the short distance factorization approach, because of the, the requirement of short distance, you, you can't do a controlled Fourier transform. 
So one has to make some model assumptions of the PDF. And in those model assumptions, uh, the PDF always goes to zero and at x equals one. And these models, because of there's only a few parameters, they will correlate the final PDF at all axes from zero to one. So the, the, the observed large uncertainty from uh, in the moderated X region could receive contributions of the arrows that are propagated from the endpoint regions. That's one um, possible source of uncertainty. And uh, also in the BNL20 analysis, uh, we only used one parameterization of the PDF. That is one particular form. And we haven't systematically studied the, de the dependence on the, on the functional form of the uh, model choice. So if there is a bias in this most popular parameterization that is X times A times one minus X times B, and then um, that would also contribute to the deviation of the two analyses. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's very difficult to, to estimate the bias from this model analysis. Sorry for going over time. So here is my conclusion. So we have carried out a state-of-the-art calculation of the pi valence PDF with the, an adapted hybrid renormalization scheme and the next next leading order perturbative matching. So the main message I want to deliver is that we can uh, do a reliable calculation of the PDF X dependence within a region of X. Uh, we have analyzed many systematics, uh, but there are still some lattice systematics, including the physical pair mass dependence and lattice spacing dependence and the finite volume effects that have not been thoroughly studied, which could be uh, room for improvement in the future. Um, and uh, I also want to point out that this same renormalization method can and also should be used in calculating the gluon PDFs and the three-dimensional uh, proton structures because it, it is the only one that deals with the renormalization at a large distance. Okay, thank you for <laughs> staying. And uh, any questions? All right, thank you for the very nice talk. This is very interesting. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Yes, Feng, go ahead. Oh, yeah, very nice talk and think, uh, Thanks. very nice. So, so maybe I, I missed that. So did you also uh, study the ZS dependence? Because ZS is the parameter you choose a uh, uh, hybrid uh, uh, skin, right? Right. I haven't varied the ZS yet uh, to, to be does honest. Does that actually, can you kind of uh, estimate, uh, does that also introduce some uncertainties in your, in your result? Mm, it can. Uh, so um, the reason I refrain from varying ZS is that if ZS is smaller, then potentially the, the finite lattice spacing dependence would be larger, which is mm -hmm, not easy to control. And if ZS is, a little larger, then it goes into the non-perturbative region, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it will also introduce uncontrolled uh, systematic. So, okay. so we find that at ZS, it turns out at least for the zero momentum matrix element after the subtraction, okay. the agreement between the lattice spacings agree very well. So that's an indication of a suppression of the discretization effects. Mm -hmm. And we also, from the OPE analysis, we believe ZS up to 0.24 for me is is probably the best we can, the, the highest we can get. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very good. Thanks. So, so may, may I ask you, so, so you, you showed this uh, sequest uh, data, mm -hmm. I guess you, you are going to do that, right? So what's the timeline and uh, what's a, I mean- uh, The sequest data, yeah. The timeline is uh, uh, probably within the next year or two. Uh, the, we need to have write a proposal on this. <laughs> we haven't write a, written a proposal on oh, calculating okay. the CPR PDF yet, but we already have all the. I think we have the all the theory methods available. The, this entire analysis done in this work can be directly applied to the proton CPR uh, distribution calculations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the, the, the question is, the, you, you, can you really reach to, for example, X point three or four, right? That's the- That's, That should be within our reach because this method is good at moderate X, right? Point- uh, no, no, here is a C, C quark. So, so C -quark. you have to go to the 
negative negative value for the x. Uh, mm -hmm. may, maybe okay. Yeah, I I don't know. We'll see. So so the the previously I, I think either LP LP three or or Martha group have calculated this right U bar minus D bar. Yeah. Uh maybe the, the results is not really meaningful to compare. I mean, this is a transversity. For unpolarized case, they also have this uh, negative X. Yeah. I didn't show here, but they, they can. Okay. I, I the, think- the, uh, yeah, the, the error band is so big, so mm -hmm. maybe you cannot see anything about it. Uh, I would say we sh probably shouldn't take that error band too seriously because <laughs> even the renormalization is not done correctly, I see, I see. Uh, it would affect uh, the C crop distribution uh, quite a lot. For the for the valence region, because the central value of the curves is already large, right? It's mm -hmm. like say of order two. Even if you have a twenty percent systematic uncertainty from the renormalization, it's probably not going to affect the shape of the curve. Yeah, yeah. But in the C crop region, uh, uh, it could be a, a little bit too optimistic. To explain prediction, yeah. I agree. I agree. Hmm. There no, no more questions from me. Okay. Thanks. Uh, do we have any more questions from the audience? I don't see anything right now. Nobody's jumping out. Uh, Feng actually took my question. So. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Uh, I think at this point we'll we'll stop in the interest of time. So thank you very much, Young. Um, this is a thank very you. nice talk. And uh, for everyone else, we'll see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank you. See you next time. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a good night. Bye bye.